John chapter 15 is where we are, but don't turn there. Turn to Psalm 80. And I will shorten my message considerably this morning. You like that, don't you? Yeah. Psalm 80. You can do what? You want to have lunch brought in? We don't need lunch. You don't need lunch. Christians are supposed to exercise self-control. I got to tell you something. I can give up a lot of things. When I give up my dinner, that's a, that's a tough one for me. <laughs> what did you say there? Oh, you got a power bar. Okay. All right. We can cut it into several pieces. Psalm 80. Let's get back on track now, folks. I love you. We'd love to fellowship and just have a good time here, but we're here to hear from the Lord, right? And you're not here to hear from me. It's not my word. This is his word. And so what we want to do is discover what he has for us this morning in this week of joy. Amen. Psalm 80. Turn with me there. If you're already there, look at verse 8. There's a metaphor that God is using here with regard to Israel. It says, for you have bought, brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it. You caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow, the mighty cedars with its boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Verse 12, why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it and all the wild beasts of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that has made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Who's the vine? No, no, no. Jesus is not the vine here. You're not reading it in context. Who's the vine? Israel. Israel. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 5 now. Isaiah 5. When we get to John 15, Jesus is the vine there for sure, right? Look with me in Isaiah chapter 5 now. Again, this metaphor of the vine, the true vine, the true vineyard is meant to be Israel at this time. Isaiah chapter 5, I'm going to look at verses 1 through 7. Now let me sing to my beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up. He cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judea, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Verse 7, lastly. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Now, this is Old Testament declaration of the unfaithfulness of Israel. But Jesus declares the same thing in the Gospels in Matthew 21 and Mark 12. Turn with me to Mark 12. The parable of the vineyard and the vine dressers. And it's important that you know the history of this metaphor of the vine, the vineyard, the vine dresser. 
the husbandman, uh, because then you'll have a good understanding of what's being shared with us by Jesus in chapter 15. Uh, so much of chapter 15 has been taken completely uh, misunderstood out of its context. So we don't want to do that this morning. Uh, we want to look for comfort in God's word where there truly is comfort, but we don't want to look for a false comfort in saying that the word is declaring something it is not. People do that today. Churches today will not even speak of sin or hell or judgment. It's a mutilation of the truth of God's word. What does Jesus himself say with regard to Israel's responsibility to be the vineyard of the Lord? Chapter 12, Mark's gospel. Then he began to speak to them in a parable or in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. He leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. Verse 3, but they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Verse 4, again, he sent them another servant and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away, shamefully treated. And again, another he sent, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Who's Jesus referring to here? The prophets. The prophets. Jesus would say later on to the religious leaders, which of the prophets have you not? Hmm. Hmm. Verse 6, therefore, still having one son, his beloved, the darling of heaven, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Who are the others? The church. The church. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So now you know the historical context of this metaphor of the vineyard. Now go to John 15. Israel was meant to be the vineyard, right? But they failed. Did God know they would fail? Yes, yes. Is there such thing as human perfection? Nay, never, never. The only one who is prefer perfect is who? Yeah, we were talking about that yesterday, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. We were doing some decorating, and I said, perfect. She said, no, it's not perfect. I said, well, nothing is. The only thing that's perfect is Jesus. So last week I told you, don't be filled with an unrealistic expectation of having a Hallmark Christmas. <laughs> Sorry to burst your bubble. Chapter 15, verse 1, John's Gospel. We have been looking at this upper room discourse. Jesus is speaking to his own, to the, the apostles, the disciples. Chapter 12 ended the public ministry of Jesus. And now, as he has rejected Israel because they have rejected him nationally, he's turned to his own. And I'd like to suggest to you that there is evidence for you to conclude that the public ministry of Jesus has ended in the United States of America. Or we couldn't possibly be able to do some of the despicable things that are done today in our nation. We couldn't possibly believe some of the craziness that people believe today in our nation had God not turned his back on the United States because we've turned our back on him. But the good news, that's the bad news. The good news is just as the private ministry of Jesus was never so powerful as it was in this upper room discourse to his own, the private ministry of Jesus to the body of Christ right now has never been more powerful. 
And the body of Christ knows it. I'm not talking about Christendom. I'm not talking about the organization called Christianity. I'm talking about the true body of Christ. There's a difference, and you need to know the difference. And so just as Jesus was ministering to his own so intimately, so privately, so tenderly, so powerfully, so he is doing right now in the body of Christ. Don't you understand that? In this upper room discourse, they're celebrating what feast? Passover, Passover. And and how did you know when it was Passover? First full moon after the fig tree buds. That's how they would know. They would look at the signs of nature. When the fig tree budded, and the fig tree figuratively means... Israel. Israel was to bear fruit for God. When the fig tree budded, they knew the next full moon was Passover. Jesus was the Passover, wasn't he? Yeah. He was the celebration, okay, of of which the the celebration of Passover simply type, sign, and symbol of. Jesus is the reality. So, as we ended chapter 14... He's finishing this discourse in the upper room. The last thing he says to them, verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Jesus is doing exactly what the Father commanded him. Jesus is saying exactly what the Father told him to say. He says, arise and let us go from here. Where did they go from? The upper room. Where are they going? The Garden of Gethsemane. What does Gethsemane mean? Olive Press. That's the place where Jesus is going to experience in his humanity that his faith in the Father has wings, that he can fly, but his life will never be more pressed. Oh, Father, if there be any other way. Father, indicative of the fact there is no other way, as he went to the cross. Why? Because he is the way the truth and the life. What is the way? The way of love, the way of agape. What is the truth? The truth of his word, his word. And the life, allowing Jesus to live his life through you, abiding in Christ, living in Christ. That's what he's talking about here. So now they're going to make their way out of the upper room. They're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They got to go down to this valley and cross this little creek. Creek? What do you call it? And in Jesus' day, that whole mountainside, that whole valley was covered with a vineyard. Vineyard. All of this becomes so real for his disciples as he speaks. It's a beautiful moonlit night. And in Solomon's temple, on both the doors of the temple, those huge Corinthian brass doors, you know, uh, were, were, were ornate Grapevines carved into the doors. On the temple itself were grapevines, representing the fact that that Israel was to be the vineyard of the Lord. Israel was to be the the vine of the Lord and bearing fruit for God. One day that will be timeless. You know that? It's going to be a wonderful thing. In, in, In Matthew 21... Jesus is going to have another confrontation with those who are rejecting him, the religious leadership who should have known. You know, there's so much that the professing church should know and they they don't know. Oh, they think they know it here. But knowing it here is not enough. You see, it's got to go from here to here. It's got to affect your life. And, And so as he's going to go in and have this confrontation once again, and they represent the nation and the national rejection of him by his own, he sees a fig tree and it's got green leaves on it but it doesn't bear any fruit. You like Bradford pears? You know what a Bradford pear is? Stinks. Oh, you know when they bloom in the spring of the year? Man, do they stink, don't they? Yeah, my neighbor's got a few. When you walk by, you say, Now, not only do they stink, but they don't bear any. They're fruitless. They got a, a pretty flower, don't they? Stinky flower, but it's a pretty flower, but it's fruitless. You know what they they really are a type of? Fake Christians. Oh, they look like Christians, but they don't smell good. And there's no fruit in their life, you know. 
Well, that was the case as Jesus was going into Jerusalem, having this confrontation. He sees this fig tree and he curses it. And what happened to the fig tree? It withered and died immediately. The fig tree figuratively represents Israel. Chapter 24, he gives a parable of the fig tree. And he said, you know, when the leaves of the fig tree turn green, you know that summer is near. He said, know this too. The generation that sees this will see the end of the age. Sees what? The rebirth of the nation of Israel. He's not talking about a literal fig tree. A fig tree's bare leaves every spring. So this has to be something unique, something extraordinary. And we know what that was. It was it's the rebirth of the nation Israel, which you and I are beginning to see, experience. He's prophesied that he would prepare the land for the people, that he would bring the people back in the land, restoring them to the land, and that he would restore the people to himself. Those two first two steps have been accomplished. He's prepared the land. He's brought the people back. Now, the only thing he hasn't done is fulfill that feast of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when they truly are restored back to the Lord. Now, that won't occur until what event happens? The rapture of the church. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so nonetheless, now, Israel should have been bearing fruit. It was not. But now he's going to declare who the genuine, true vine of God really is. The one who really bears fruit for God. And that's Jesus himself. He said that uh, I am the true light. Remember? He said, I am the true bread. Everything else is artificial. Being the true light, what did that mean? That he's life. There is no life apart from him. I don't care what else your life may be consumed with, what other pursuits you may have. If, if it isn't him, you're dead while you let li yet live. There is no life in you. The light of Christ is the one who only brings life. I am the way, the truth, the life. Chapter 15, verse 1, I am. Now, all right, this is the last of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes about himself. What do we call that technically? Tetragrammaton, the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter Hebrew name for God, I am. And what it essentially means is that whatever you need me to be, I am. Isn't that wonderful that we serve a God who can meet your every need? Not your want. It's not a, it's not a Santa Claus that you give him a wish list, okay? But he meets your every need. I am. I am the true vine, the genuine vine. As he is the true light, as he is the true bread, he is the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me. And you got to stay focused on this because he's talking about how we need to be in Christ. We can't be separated from the vine. Life is only found in Jesus. If you're separated from Jesus, there is no life. Separated from Jesus, there is no fruit. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, right? So you need to be in him, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that, he, that bears fruit, he prunes that it bears more fruit. So there's fruit, there's more fruit, there's mucho grande fruit, lots of fruit, right? And that's what God desires. And it's progressive, you know? You know what's happened to your life as you come to Christ, you yield more and more of your life, and there's a fruitfulness in your life. And then, and then as you grow in Christ and your relationship to him, and it becomes more intimate, more personal, there's more fruit in your life. And, and then really, you want to be at that place where you just let yourself go to God. And the fruit is overwhelming. It's in abundance where everybody could declare, there's something different about you. I haven't met many Christians like you. Hmm? Isn't that what should be said? We go to the library next Saturday. How God used this farmer. You got to understand, Billy Graham was nothing more than a milk farmer's son. J J David was the shepherd boy of Israel. That's all he ever saw himself as. The shepherd boy of Israel, Jesse's son. And Billy Graham never saw himself anything more than a farmer's son, a farmer. But how God touched the world through this milk farmer's boy. Fruit, much fruit, ooh, mucho fruit. You're going to be amazed. You'll be amazed. I, I'm always amazed when I go up there. I think it's, I don't know, my eighth, ninth, tenth time, I don't know. But I'm, I'm always just at awe. Hey, that's what God did through that man. Now, God did it. Billy didn't. 
All Billy had to do was to be found faithful. Hey, what does God want to do in your life? All you, listen, you, you, I don't know if you'll ever do what Billy Graham did, but, but you can have the same reward as Billy Graham because all that's required of you is to be faithful. Is that right, Henry? You're going to be faithful? And who knows what God will do with you, Henry? Hmm? Yeah. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, in chapter 13, we looked at Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, and when he was washing their feet, that's a specific word he would use where he's just cleansing a part of the body. Maybe you wash your hands, you wash your feet. Uh, but then Peter said, no, don't, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. And the Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, if I don't sanctify you, it's obvious you have no part in me. There's no salvation where there isn't any sanctification. And then Peter said, well, give me a bath, Lord. Wash everything. And Jesus said, you're already bathed. You're already clean. Same word. You're already clean. You're already made pure. I'm pure? You know better than that, don't you? <laughs> but legally, in a forensic way, I am pure. Why? Because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that's what he was referring to. That's what we call, in Christian terms, justification. But justification is never alone. Saving faith is never alone, right? You're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It always produces good works, fruit. We call that, in legalese, in Christianese, sanctification, right? So you've already been made pure, justified, bathed, and now all you need is to be washed, sanctified. Why do I need to be sanctified? Because I walk in the wilderness of this world and I get dirty. Did you get your feet dirty this week? You sure did. You know you did. We can't help it. We get contaminated. And, and most of the time, we're not even aware of the contamination that's come into our life. We need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you. How, mu how much have I accommodated? How much have I compromised? How much have I allowed the world to creep into my life? Set me free, Lord. Hmm. Now, he can say this. And what does he say? Look, at verse... Three, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. They were all clean. Who was there? The 11 apostles, except somebody just left. Who was that? Judas. Judas. And he said, you're all clean. Previously in chapter 13, you're all clean but one. One. Now he's going to talk about abiding and he's going to talk about fruit. There's eight verses. He's going to mention fruit. How many times? Eight times. He's going to mention to abide, to be in Christ. How many times? Eight times. Eight times, eight verses. You think he's trying to emphasize something? That you'll only produce fruit, any fruit worth anything, if you abide. Verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. The question has to be asked. Do you recognize your complete and total dependence upon Jesus? Eric and I were having a conversation not too long ago. And we we're talking about eternal things, you know. They're saying, you know, you can, you can, there's a lot of things you can study in this life, disciplines that you can uh, be studying and have an education in. There are a lot of pursuits that you can pursue in this life. But all of it, as soon as you exhale for the last time and you enter heaven's air, it evaporates into meaninglessness. It's nothing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, think of every discipline that could be imagined, that you could study, that you become an expert in, in this world today, and all of it evaporates into meaninglessness when you exhale here for the last time and you inhale heaven's air. Is that true? Except your knowledge of the word. And I do believe one other thing. Remember what that thing was, Eric? Music. Music. 90 minutes in heaven. Uh, Don Piper. No, not John Piper. He's the pastor. Don Piper, the, the Baptist minister who died and was clinically dead for 90 minutes. Anybody ever read the book or hear his testimony? What was the one thing he said he was amazed about in heaven? Sounds. The music. The music of heaven is like nothing you would ever hear on earth. So, may, so maybe, maybe your knowledge of music is eternal too. But your knowledge of the word certainly is. But we need to abide in him to produce the 
fruit that God wants to bear in our lives. For without me, you can do. Now, he's going to show you that. And sometimes it's painful. You put forth your best effort and you wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do this for you, God. And what does he do? He laughs. I, I was listening to somebody the other day talking about all their plans and all the, the, the program they have and how they're going to get here at this certain time. And you want to make God laugh? Just tell him your plans. <laughs> tell him what you intend to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a Yule log. <laughs> But it was the motivation of it all. Love, right? Yeah. Verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Fruit, much fruit. Hmm. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and it is withered and gathered them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Ezekiel 15 tells us that, that wood from a grapevine is, is what? Worthless. Wood from a grapevine, if it isn't producing grapes, has no other purpose. It is worthless. Ezekiel 15, God is going to great length explaining that if your life is fruitless, you're only good to be burned, burned in the fire. Have you ever seen a, a, a table made out of a grapevine or a wooden peg or a chair? No, no. If the vine has one purpose, one purpose only to bear fruit. And if it's not bearing fruit, it is good for to be burned. And, and you don't even use it to, to, to uh, supply heat in your home, do you? No, because it burns so rapidly and doesn't give out a much, a much heat. Uh, so how do we apply that to our lives as Christians? If, if our, listen to me, if your life, if our life, if a person's life isn't bearing any fruit for God, then his life is, do you believe that? I'll bet many of you don't. But if you're here any length of time at all, walking with the Lord, he's going to show you that apart from him, apart from him working within us, our life is worthless. Now, wait a minute. What has happened previously? Context is king when you interpret the scriptures, right? So what did he reveal in chapter 13? One of you will betray me. One of you is not, aren't any, bearing any fruit in your life, in your heart for me. And you need to go. Do what you must do and do it. Go. You're set sail. You're let loose. Go. Did he go? Yep. Yeah. So is, is, who's Jesus talking about here in this text? Is he talking about Judas? Is he talking about Israel? Is he talking about Sinos? You got rhinos, and then we have sinos, right? Rhino, what's a rhino? What's a sino? Christian in name only. Is he, listen, is he talking about Judas, Israel, or Christians who profess to be Christians and don't bear any fruit? I think the uh, conclusion you can come to is he's talking about all three. And a life that isn't being lived for God, that isn't producing fruit... It grieves God, but that life is useless. That's what he's saying. Good only for the flame to be burned. Jesus would say, for those who are not following him, pursuing him, they are dead while they yet live. Life is only found in Christ. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. This, this, this casting out that he's talking about here, if you go back to verse 2 for a minute, he says he, casts, he takes away. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Anybody have an interpretation of that takes away in your Bible? If you have a study Bible, there's a little note. What does it say? I'm sorry? Lifts up. What does he lift you up for? What? Light? His light? 
No. Now, that's a common interpretation today where you can presume upon the grace of God, you, you can have a saved soul and a lost life. Is that true? Judas, was he lifted up to the light? Israel, did they suffer the judgment that God brought upon them? The Greek word here for lifted up, it means to lift up your anchor and set sail. Get the shield out of here. <laughs> I mean, that's what it means. I'm not making that up. Go back and get your lexicon, your Greek lexicon, and look at the word. Now, now there are teachers today who say, oh, God wants to lift you up. Is that true? I lift my hands to how great I am. That's their song. That's not what it's saying, beloved. And don't let anybody lie to you and convince you otherwise. If you're not bearing fruit for God, you're not abiding in God. You can't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within your life without him producing fruit. Right? Where there is justification, there has to be sanctification. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that deuteronomous power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead abides in every believer who has the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit and you're not producing fruit, the Holy Spirit will convict you then. Hey, can we talk? Now we need to make a change. You're right. I can't do it. I know you can't do it. Just ask me. I'll help you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what the text is saying. Please don't allow anybody to mutilate the text on you. I listened to a pastor do that last night. <laughs> oh, it, also, it's, it just sounds so comforting, doesn't it? That, that I, I can disobey God, I can sin, I can live the life I want to live and still be assured that I'm going to be lifted up in the light. It's just not true. I don't care how much Joel professes that. <laughs> anyway. And listen, they deceive and they are being deceived themselves. Why? Why? Motivation. What is their motivation? Hmm. Popularity, pleasures, possessions, right? I've told you before, I don't have any problem with sin except three. I only have a problem with three sins. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's all. <laughs> Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. When you abide in Jesus, one of the things that produces exactly what we did this morning. You ask. What do you do? You pray. But you don't ask. You know, you rarely would you ask for yourself when you're praying in the spirit, when you're praying in Christ, when Christ is praying through you. I always say, you got to pray long enough to where you finally begin to truly pray, <laughs> right? That abiding will always produce a life of prayer. Now, it doesn't have to be something official. You know, you can be like my friend, the Reptevi, and the fiddler on the roof. He's always praying, always talking to God. But there's a constant communication between you and God. God is speaking to you through the circumstances of life and through the stirrings in your heart, and then you're responding. And it'll always produce joy, joy. What is joy? J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you last. It's always Jesus first, then others, and then you last. That joy produces Yes, by this my Father is glorified that you bear mucho fruit so that you will be my disciples. The first abiding fruit is a life of prayer. The next abiding fruit, we'll see this in verse 9, is joy. Verse 12, joy. The next abiding fruit will be in verse 10, which is obedience. And uh, lastly, we can talk about the, uh, uh, excuse me, love is in 9 and 12. And then, and then in 11, we have joy. So abiding in Christ will produce a life of prayer, of joy, of obedience, of love. And the joy, your joy, that inward quality of joy, of, 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 it's beyond happiness. Happiness is dependent upon outward circumstances. We're not always happy, are we? But we can always be joyful. Joyful is within and joyful is directly related to your obedience to God. The more you're in obedience to God, the more he fills your heart and your life with joy. 
What happens when you're disobedient? You know, what happens when I have a fight with Gail? Rarely would ever happen. I, I go downstairs and, and connect paper clips. I, I twist rubber bands. I, you know, I mean, you just got to make it right, right? And I know, so it's, it's, you know, I'm just, sometimes I wake up and I'm Igor, you know, right? Yes. But when, when things are not right between us, it's, it's miserable. You got to make it right, don't we? Don't we? You have to, right? And so when we argue, we hold hands, right? Hold hands, look each other in the eye and go for it. And what happens? You can't do it. You can argue from a distance. But Zach, Camille, when you're, when you're angry with one another, it never happens for you guys, I know. But if it should ever happen, if, just hold each other's hands, look each other in the eye and then go for it. And let me tell you something. You can't argue very long. Pretty soon you start laughing, you know. Joy for the Christian is dependent upon the level of obedience for which they are obeying their father, their God, their friend, their savior. And the more obedient we are, the more joy our life is filled with. The more disobedient you are, you come in here like this. Sourpuss. No, it's true, it's true. You watch a person's continence, that'll tell you. Right? You have a skip in your step. You have a song in your heart when you're obedient to the Lord. When, when you know that your life is right with God, you wake up singing. Don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 9. And we're going to end here in a minute. Uh, I, I will not be able to finish this text. So next week, when we have the emphasis upon love, I will finish this portion of chapter 15. Hey, aren't you glad God's in control of the service? Yes. And not me? So I intended to go through the whole chapter. Or do you want me to? No, of course you don't. The nursery workers will hang me. <laughs> Verse 9. As the Father loved agapeo me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. We abide in prayer. We abide in obedience. Verse 10 is the obedience portion. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So we abide in prayer. We abide in obedience. We abide in love. And what does it produce? Joy. Joy. True joy. These things, verse 11, I have spoken to you that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. Wow. I got that joy, 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 joy. Where? Where? I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Is it true? You can sing it, but have you experienced it? That's the difference, you see. And even just singing it puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? I see you over there. <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, but boy, when we're living it, prayer, obedience, love, when we allow those things to abide in us, Christ Jesus, Colossians 3.3, 3, what does it say? My life has now been hid in Christ, in God. Is that where your life is? Or is your life somewhere else? Is your life found in some other pursuit? you will be found wanting. You'll come up short change. You'll come up empty. I can testify to you these last 41 years or whatever it's been, my heart is content. It's full. I'm so thankful. But I know that it's dependent upon me continually following him, walking in his path. Now, living the Christian life is not you pulling yourself by your bootstraps and walking the way you should. It's, it's surrendering your life to him to allow him to live his life through you. It's the life of prayer that he gives you. It's a life of obedience that he strengthens you with. It's a life of love that he flows through you. It's a life of joy that radiates within you because of his person. All these doctrines, all these wonderful truths that are found in the scriptures, yes, we believe them in our head, but they're a person. The gospel is a person, not a formula or a method or a program. 
It's all of it. It's a person. Have you allowed the person of Christ, the Christ of Christmas, to truly enter into your life? And then it's Christmas every day. Every day is Christmas. Amen? Shall we stand?